Ooh, dead silence today. So, I'm going to show you a game from, to you guys, the way, way back to adults, the not that long ago. And this is in 2011, and I was still working to break 2200. I was living in Mississippi, uh, working on my master's degree in sociology at Mississippi State. So, since you're living there, you can compete for state champion. And uh, this was when... I started like my breakout year. I think it was because I took time off the year before this, like 2010. I was like one of the most active players in my state. I played like everywhere I could as much as I could. And then in 2011, I played like five tournaments because uh, I was in grad school and really busy. So when I went to the Mississippi State Championship, I mean, it was during midterms week, and I just wanted a distraction. And I knew I was the highest rated player going in, and I really, really wanted to win. So basically, I was 2150, and then there were like four guys who were 2000. And I had to play all of them back to back to back to back. And I handed all of them their butts back to back to back to back. I perfect scored and became the Mississippi State champion. And then a little bit of trivia. If anybody in the YouTube can figure this out, that'd be awesome. I believe I'm the only player in United States history to be a sitting state champion in both states at the same time because they typically have state championships on Labor Day weekend, but the Mississippi state championship happened in October. I moved back to Alabama and won the Alabama state championship in September. So I was the state champion of both Mississippi and Alabama at the same time for about a month or two. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one. If I'm not the only one, it's a very short list because you actually have to live in the state in order to be counted as state champion. Like, that's how I got the Blitz title this year in Florida. Like, Ben Feingold came and took first, but he's from Georgia. So they were like, mm, oh, okay, there's Brian. There we go. You're the state champion of Blitz. Congratulations. So, yeah, paper titles. Fun stuff. So – this was one of my main rivals, and he'd actually beaten me in a tournament um, in, in September previously, so I really, really wanted to beat him. He's a young kid, and you just got to put the young ones in their place, you know. Mm -hmm. So I knew what he was going to play beforehand. He likes this simple English stuff, and the move order that I used forces him to play this type of English setup. And the reason I chose this, mm -hmm, ice cream cone, can I go get my head ache, headache, what, what is that word? Headphones. headphones, yes, you can, you can get your headphones. I'm sorry, but when the student is like trying not to speak during the video and writes in small print and they're sitting on the other type of side of the room, bless your heart. So... I'm surprised my eyesight's that good. I've been worried about my eyes lately. So I look at a computer screen like 16 hours a day. Um, so when we get to C4, the thing about this versus, say, a normal King's Indian structure is normally this knight's on F6, and you got to get this knight out of the way somehow in order to be able to play F5. So it slows down the attack. Well, since I haven't moved the knight, I can go F5 straight away. So this shows I have very aggressive intentions. So the main reason I'm showing you guys this game is the main thing that you guys struggled with when you crapped the bed at the state championship was you messed up your opening, you realized you messed up your opening at the board, and then freaked out, and instead of taking your time and actually like figuring out what to do, you played faster and then just wrecked yourself. So we're going to get to a key moment, and development's pretty natural. He's going to play B4, so I stop it. I can't stop B4, so I just continue my development. I take, get the open file for my rook. And now on H6, this is still following the main line. Both of us are playing what is recommended as best by both sides so far in the database. After B5, knight E7, still following. And right here, my opponent thought for a while and then played H4. Let me show you what the main line is. Main line is bishop B2. Bishop's got to go somewhere. Bishop e6, preparing for some central action. He tries to get the open file and contest it. I say no, you can have it. Develops the queen. G5 to start the attack. He's attacking on the other side of the board. 
And this is following preparation. You're going to go all out with black. I was prepared to do this. If you don't win in the middle game, you're going to have a wrecked pawn structure in the end game. You're going to lose. This is a typical like Kings Indian player type setup in game. So now that you've seen what the typical plan is for black, you need to know what the main line was, which I'd studied. I was prepared to play in this game. So when we got right here and he played h4, my note is this is out of character in the position and now black is already better. Now, I knew that this wasn't a move and he just, he just like played a move. And I understand his point. It restricts g5 because my last move was h6. It looks like I'm going to play g5. But he already changed something which is pretty significant. And this moment, as soon as your opponent makes a change, whether it be good or bad, because let's say that at the time, I didn't know that it was bad. I had a sense that it was bad, but I didn't. I, I wasn't just like, oh, and it's wrong. I can prove it by playing this move, and here's the plan, and I just win. No. No. So I want you guys to take a look at this position and try to come up with the best way to go forward with black here, to try to take advantage of the fact that h4 wasn't the best move. And it takes trying to figure out why h4 wasn't good. The viewers at home can do it as well. Uh-huh, broken. Play e4. Play e4. Okay, after d takes e4? Uh, f takes e4. Knight takes e4? Mm-hmm. That would work if I just like hanging pieces. So e4, d e4, f e4. Let's say I go knight d2. Now I've got like the bishop on g2, the knight on d2, the knight on c3. Everybody's hitting e4. So e4 is is a critical move which can break up the structure in the long term. We definitely need to be considering it. But the question is, is it ready right now? Because we're about to make a mess of the position with e4, guaranteed. So e4 is definitely a move to consider, but I don't think it's quite ready yet. Mm -hmm. D5 hangs upon. D5, knight takes e5. No, I'm saying after d5, he's going to take that one. Free. Free. Uh-huh. Knight h5 is pretty good. Yep. That's the move I played in the game. Knight h5, because you can play for e4 or f4, and you're looking to break up the structure. Now, say with the line that I gave you, with e4 and takes and the pawns there and the knight moves, when I play e3, that pawn will be weak too now. Make sense? How it's just completely wrecking his kingside structure. h4 left it to where it's much easier to attack now. So he plays knight d2, trying to play prophylaxis against us. So what would you play now? If you play f4... Doesn't he get a ton of squares like e4 and d5 for his knights? Uh huh. Mm hmm. So now he's got to, in the very least, make a defensive move somehow for his knight on c3 because our bishop is taking the time to give a little tickle tickle. So he plays queen b3. You can do that in your own time. Yeah. So, <laughs> so after queen b3, all right, we talked about this plan a little bit earlier. So what's the follow-up here to shatter his position? e3. Logically, he's going to take. I grabbed that one, and his pawns look ridiculous now. I know that I'm already much better in the position. 
So now it's 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 putting him away. So rook f3. And it's one of those things, like if you're playing puzzle rush, you're like, yeah, bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, knight takes c2, he moves his king, I win his queen, yeah, I win. No, because he doesn't, yeah, bishop takes c3, he's going to play rook takes g3, and you've left your king wide open because your bishop's the best defender. I am not going to give up this bishop unless I'm, like, winning a queen or it's ending in mate. He is needed for defensive purposes because I've moved every pawn in front of my king. That's called death if you're not careful. So don't be too quick to be impulsive here. So first, I just simply come back. I've done the damage. Now we withdraw. King h7, just making sure there's no weaknesses, getting out of the way. c5, no. None of that. And the great thing about this type of dynamic, when you have an exact number of pawns, no matter how he pushes, you push the other way and lock it, and he gets no counterplay. So the center, it's not doing anything at the moment. And the queenside play after this move d5 is going to be shut down pretty effectively. So only I can play on the king side. That's exactly what we're looking for with this type of one-way attacking position. So he goes c6. And in here... I thought about taking, but then, or I thought about pushing rather and locking as I was talking about. But the main thing I noticed here was I can complete development and I have extra ideas that the c6 pawn is going to fall. So, first bishop e6, and maybe like at a certain time, playing d4 could be a big threat. He goes knight b5. He's trying to get to the d4 square. So I'm like, okay, let's just bring the bishop back to a square where I'm still having this diagonal idea. But at the same time, it's defended and it's not in the way. Knight d4. So this is his plan. He's protecting the c6 pawn. And I thought for a bit here, and keep in mind, like the time controls for this tournament was like game in 60. So, like I said, I don't want to give up this bishop unless I'm sure. So, I'm already thinking about taking on d4, but first I play rook e8 because f4, like, f4 feels all wrong because I'm helping him get rid of a permanent weakness that he has that he can't get rid of. So, I'm going to go rook e8. One, it gets off the pin of this bishop, so the knight can move to potentially take there. And two, it's lining up with these potential weaknesses that are stuck on the e-file. So bishop c5, a kind of, like, I pass move. And now, there's a lot of different moves here that black could play, but bishop takes d4 is what I played in the game. And... The next few moves are all to counterattack the dark squares to cover my, my weaknesses on the long diagonal. So I give up my amazing bishop in order to keep going. I see, like, I, I keep getting... The, the initiative is mine, like 100%. So he attacks my knight. 95. Every move that I'm making, it's all about maintaining the initiative and keeping the attack going. So now I'm hitting the rook. He plays, he takes d4. In between move, rook b8. And after queen a5, this is a blunder. And let's treat this like a tactics problem. Black to play and win. Find the most optimal way to win the game. It's like I look over at the class. Everybody's trying to solve the tactic except for Ben, who's looking at me. <laughs> Rook takes b2 is somewhere in the combination. Because, like, for instance, if you start with Rook takes b2, 
you can't always play queen takes d4 check. Right. Braden, what you got? His queen would just move. More forcing. Okay, start with the most forcing move. What's the most forcing move? Knight takes f3. And then, like we've got the exchange at least, so then he's got to take stock. So with knight takes f3, if he takes with the knight, then the e2 pawn hangs. So he takes with the bishop. Now we remove the guard. So when he takes, queen check, gg. He resigned. So from start to finish, the point of this game was as soon as your opponent does something that you didn't expect in a game and you have time to think, that is the point where you stop and think and come up with a plan. You have that internal dialogue and you go, well, what is different about this position compared to where I was trying to go to what I knew? And you do not move until you figure that out. Because I can promise you, if you have that key moment, and rolling it back to this key moment where H4 was played, and that's the entire reason I show you this game is because of this one move within the lesson. And it's, you've got to, when your opponent does something out of the character in the position, and you know it, to not move on until you figure out a plan. It may take you 20 minutes out of your 60 minutes, but if you find the correct plan, you're going to know the next five, six moves without having to think too much, and you're going to make your time back up. So that's pretty much it for uh, this one. It's just a game that I thought about, and we're trying to target those problem areas that you guys have. It really sounded like somebody who's like working a weight loss company right now. So we gotta work on those cottage cheese thighs. You know, we gotta pro we gotta target the problem areas that you have. So it's the same same kind of deal with this. You're struggling with the openings, so get on Leech S and study the openings, which hopefully the internet's working now. All right, that's it for this one.